All right. So once again, welcome. I'm Marini Allen, and I'm the director of the Institute for Classics Education. We are a 501c3 nonprofit in the United States, and our mission is to provide free resources and support to educators who teach Homer and ancient Greek texts in English translation. Uh, we also strive to uh, provide resources for really anyone who is interested in learning more about the ancient classics. Uh, in addition to our hour-long Saturday seminars like this one, we run 12-week courses on the Iliad in the fall and the Odyssey in the spring, and we continue to develop new courses by request. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions about our programs or would like to request a program. I am going to put my email and our website in the chat once we're underway. Uh, so today I'm thrilled to welcome Lauren Heilman. Lauren is a postgraduate researcher at the University of Birmingham working on her PhD in classics and ancient history. Uh, she earned her master's of arts degree from Villanova University in classical studies and she holds a BA in French and a BA in English from Bob Jones University and upon graduation was awarded Outstanding Graduate of Modern Languages and Literatures as well as Outstanding Graduate of English Language and Literature. She was spotlighted for her postgraduate comparative French classical research and translated work uh, by Auburn University. And she has many interests, but her primary research focus is on the intersection of classical and biblical texts, the development of cult symbols in ancient uh, to classical Greek literature, ancient Greek philosophy, and classics reception in the centos of Proba and Eudokia. So Lauren, uh, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Irini. It's always a pleasure and excitement to be part of here with the Institute and to see so many lovely familiar faces. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen here. Just a moment. Let's see if this will get underway. Oops, has the chat in the moment. I'm trying to get it back. Oh, also, this is a spoiler. There we go. So did everyone see the screen all right? I think it's working fine now. So if you signed up for a variety of lectures, this one is going to be the one on Achilles and Hamlet, heroic intersections. And I was so excited that I get to talk to you about two of my favorite heroes in all of literature, and hopefully two of yours as well as you're joining me today. So as we're looking at Achilles and Hamlet, I wanted to begin by looking at this quote from Harold Bloom in Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, because he says that the phenomenon of Hamlet, the prince, that is not even just looking at the play, but the prince without the play, is unsurpassed in the West's imaginative literature. Approximation can extend here to a few figures of ancient literature, Helen of Troy, Odysseus, Achilles among them. And since we will be paralleling Hamlet and Achilles today, I thought it was nice to see a scholar looking at the fact that Hamlet really is unparalleled in modern literature. We have to go back to the ancient world to try to find someone similar for him. So I think part of what we're going to be doing today will actually help us contextualize both heroes and help us to understand them better within their own realms and their own worldviews and how different they are from the modern worldview as well. So I really don't think that there are any two figures of myth or drama that can claim to have fascinated the mind as much as Achilles and Hamlet nor have any two been more greatly maligned. The chief complaint launched against either one lies squarely in their seeming inaction. The one strumming his lyre while his companions are slaughtered, the others supposedly whiling away his time in soliloquies and banter as Denmark lies rotten, and then their tendencies toward melancholic lament. Now, while each hero does in fact fulfill his destined role at the appropriate time and brings about his own death in the process, in the popular imagination, each has lost the name of action but it is the name only that is lost. In this paper today, or this presentation, by juxtaposing Homeric hero and Shakespearean, will address the problem of delay in both, demonstrating that their delays have much more than mere dramatic necessity, but rather are integral to the classic unseasonality ripening in each hero. But as we go in, I first wanna look a little bit at the classical education that existed in Shakespeare's day, because this will help us understand how Shakespeare had a model for the classics in the back of his mind as he's preparing each of his plays. First of all, you'll see the schedule on the left, which was a typical grammar school education in Shakespeare's day, rising at 5 a.m., having class from six to nine, a brief breakfast, then class from 9.15 to 11, dinner, then one to five, again, class, supper, and then six to seven, you would have recitations in front of the class of everything that you had learned during the day. And Johnson, 
Here, as you can see on your right, he has a bit of a parallel. It says a customary exercise was to compose Latin prose, this would be in your grammar school, and then turn it into one or more prescribed metrical forms. Accordingly, Ben Johnson, once he starts writing his plays, he said that he composed his plays in prose and then turned his prose into verse and was merely continuing to do in English what he had learned to do in Latin grammar school. So the rigorous training that they got, they did have a great number of Latin authors that they had to go through and to be able to translate in class in poetry, then into English and then back Back into Latin poetry, they would have to do sort of double translation, really prepared them to be the great wielders of the English language that they were, and especially Shakespeare. So that the classics should serve as a model to writers in Shakespeare day is clearly no surprise. The grammar school system that Shakespeare is believed is least very highly likely to have attended was nothing short of military rigor, as we can see, waking at five in the morning and concluding at six or seven in the evening. And that was founded chiefly on Latin composition and double translation. But Greek was not neglected, as you'll see here. This is a quote from Shakespeare's use of the arts of language. The study of Greek, meanwhile, uh, Greek grammar presented in Latin would have also begun. So we think about our modern day Teubner editions, which has been the frustration of many a Hellenist, how you have the introduction in Latin and the notes in Latin. Well, it was the same thing here, the outburst of the Roman education system, but still they're studying Greek just with their Latin explanations of the grammar. So the study of Greek grammar presented in Latin would also have begun with accompanying, construing, and parsing in Latin of Greek sentences and the translation of Latin sentences into Greek. Next would follow the reading and writing of longer passages in prose and verse with attention to constructions, topics, figures, and the changing of verse to prose and prose to verse. The Greek New Testament, Isocrates, and Homer were most often required for reading, but the curriculum might also include Aesop, Lucian, Demosthenes, Hesiod, Pindar, Euripides, Xenophon, Dionysus of Halicarnassus, Plutarch, Theocritus, Heliodorus, and St. Basil's Epistles. So they had quite the reading list to go through in the original Greek, and any of these could have been used in the grammar school. It is very probable that at the very least, Shakespeare would have been translating from the Greek New Testament, but he's certainly familiar with Homer, as we can see from his works as well. So going through here, we have something that has come out of order here. I'm so sorry, my pages got all out of order. Here we are. Now, as we were talking about this with the Greek study of grammar, T.W. Baldwin actually did a whole study on this lengthy works of Elizabethan education in Minutia, and he interpreted Ben Jonson's description of Shakespeare as having small Latin and less Greek to refer to this typical education that we've just outlined. So while Shakespeare's knowledge of Greek, as people have said, may have paled in comparison to instruction of Latin, as we can see from this study, that nonetheless, it probably rivaled a modern day university student understanding of Greek, or at least had a good grasp of the language and rhetoric. So we can't consider him to be um, illiterate in the ancient languages. And with such an education, with or without intention, it would be difficult to avoid employing uh, classical models onto one's own literary or dramatic heroes. And two, Aristotle's poetics. We know how popular Aristotle was in the Renaissance and up through Shakespeare's day. The poetics formed the ideas of tragedy that were employed from the Renaissance on, and Shakespeare was keenly aware of those models, which will become evident when we get to Act Five of Hamlet. Now, this is a quote from the Riverside Shakespeare that I thought was particularly apt because it describes Shakespeare's writing genius in terms of Greek. It says, Shakespeare became a different man in those early years at the Globe. He found his daimon. And for uh, all the Greek students in the class, it is that daimon is a supernatural force, the idea of the god uh, breathing through or infusing his own genius through the hero. And that's the way Shakespeare is being depicted as he's writing and breathing out these deliciously beautiful English uh, plays. Now, today's subject of having two bards, I'm delighted that we get to have two bards today, the bards of Hios and the bards of Avon. So juxtaposing Homer and Shakespeare, even before we juxtapose their heroes, it might be fun to sort of look through the comparisons in their methods of composing. So in dealing with either bard, Homer or Shakespeare, one is immediately confronted with textual difficulties, of course. Homer the man may never have existed, but he rather represented an oral tradition of quasi-inspired bards composing spontaneously in performance and drawing upon and altering myths of divine significance to their audiences. Now, standardization of text was antithetical to the spirit of oral performance, obviously, but when versions of the American songs were in fact recorded, they could function as scripts to be memorized and recited as by rhapsodes. Now, the dramatic performance of part or whole of Homer, such as at the Panathenaea, 
would be cloaked in religious festival significance for both the rhapsode and the audience. But the texts that are preserved for us inevitably reflect the distinct political flavors of the polis in which they were preserved, and both the variety and unfortunately some of the musical quality of the oral versions are lost for us. So whenever we're looking at Homer, we have to remember that we're prisoners of reception and that we can't really uh, go back and grasp what it would have been like to hear these sung performed in the original um, religious festival ceremonies. Now with Shakespeare, well, as Homer, we know that he, we don't know whether he existed or not. With Shakespeare, we definitely know that he's a historical person. There's no doubt of this man's existence, though some world-weary scholars have tried to disprove his authorship over the years. Now, identifying a standard text of Hamlet, however, is nearly as tenuous as identifying a standard text of the Iliad, because publications, some of which were certainly unauthorized, of folios and quartos containing a variety of missing lines or whole scenes was not uncommon, and it certainly adds to the confusion of determining which version of Hamlet was actually performed. Now, there is a lost early version, which is called the Ur Hamlet, that is said to have existed, and some have proposed that it might have been written by Thomas Kidd, who had written the Spanish tragedy. However, a few scholars, Harold Bloom notably among them, proposed that Shakespeare himself wrote the early Hamlet and that he revised it most of his life. Now, according to Bloom, he says here that the possibility remains, though this is heresy to virtually all modern Shakespeareans, that just this once Shakespeare wrote partly out of a purely private compulsion, knowing that he would have to slash his text with every staging. That may account for the difference between the second quarto's 3,800 lines and the first folio's omission of 230 of those lines. That the first folio contains an additional 80 lines not found in the second quarto may indicate that Shakespeare went on revising Hamlet after 1604 to 1605 when the second quarto appeared. I take it that the folio may have been Shakespeare's last acting version, though at 3,650 lines, it would still have been remarkably long for the London stage. Our complete Hamlet of 3,880 lines has the virtue of reminding us that the play is not only the Mona Lisa of literature, but also is Shakespeare's white elephant and an anomaly in his canon. Now, I just want to add to this that some quartos, some folios admit very crucial scenes, such as the moment where Claudius is praying and Hamlet is about to kill him, but decides not to because he's afraid of sending him directly to heaven while his father languishes in purgatory, which would, of course, be a very incomplete form of revenge and uh, wouldn't help out his father very much. Some versions admit that entirely, which can affect the way that the play is interpreted. And of course, there were always um, versions that were sort of stolen or leaked to the press in a way to gain a few extra dollars so that another uh, theater might try to be able to get a copy and put on their own production. So that's, we really have no means of knowing exactly which is the version that Shakespeare wrote and that he intended to um, have produced. But carrying on, whether or not Bloom was correct in asserting that any notion of the private uh, was in Shakespeare's mind when he was composing, the play ultimately was written to be performed and to be performed in a public space. So in short, it was to be heard. Whether you were groundling or Greek, one did not come to performance to see so much as they did to hear. So even in Shakespeare's day, one spoke of hearing a play as one might have heard the Song of Ilium. You did not go to see it, you went to hear the music of the verse, the music of the English language being spoken, just as you would have gone to hear the song of the Greeks being sung. And then this also is a good reminder of the definition of singing, because singing is no more than sustained speech. We are all basically speaking in recitative or in a staccato type of form of what was previously song. So even if you kept calling on and holding your verse like this, it could eventually become song. So all we are doing, whether we are singing or whether we're speaking, singing is simply sustained speech. So the type of verse that would be spoken in Shakespeare was even seen as being connected to a kind of song. And of course, Shakespeare put a lot of songs into his plays as well. So the song is merely sustained speech, as we've said, and Shakespeare's Hamlet urges his players to speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. And Shakespeare was no stranger to the music of language any more than he was opposed to inserting actual music into his plays. And the plays that were performed at Black Friars had a great deal because of the um, atmosphere there, they were able to use a lot more music. And so he had plays that were written specifically for that theater were able to have a lot more songs inserted into them. And they lent themselves to having particular, in particular to having musical insertions. But Hamlet too contains songs, uh, most memorably in Ophelia's Mad, song, uh, mad Scenes, and in fact, it was customary in the 19th century to cast not actresses, but professional singers in the role, much to the um, lament of the actresses that really wanted to play this role. If you weren't a professional singer, you really didn't get cast. Even for the snippets of song that she sings in the mad scene, it was considered to be a more musical role. 
And then we have, though the Iliad being presented to us as a text, we know that it is in fact a song or a song embedded with various other songs, hearkening back to the past and realizing that past in the present through song. And such is the function of lament as well. So in Hamlet, lament occurs in soliloquies as well as in dialogue, and Hamlet's sustained speeches function as laments, or in Renaissance terms, melancholic reflection or memento mori. So I wanted to look at a kind of lament that shows up in uh, Hamlet, and this is something that if you're watching any of the film versions, you won't see exactly, because this is the time that Gertrude tells Laertes of the death of Ophelia. And of course, this couldn't be acted out on stage. She shows up at a crucial moment and relays one of the most poignant it scenes that you only ever see in Hamlet terms in your mind's eye. However, if you watch it in a film, they'll normally cut it entirely and just show Ophelia's death scene and maybe have someone voice over this portion. But in the original text or the original play of Hamlet, Gertrude comes in and is soothing Laertes with this poetic recitation of how Ophelia, his sister, died. And it does function as lament. Here she describes that there is a willow grows a scant the brook that shows his hoar leaves in the glassy stream. Therewith fantastic garlands did she make of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs her coronet weeds clamoring to hang, an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old logs, as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and endued unto that moment. But long it could not be till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Now, scholars have questioned, and it is strange how scholars always try to be so practical in a moment of beautiful poetry, but they've questioned, how did Gertrude see all of this and not go there and help Ophelia if she knew that this was happening? Well, it's important to know when this moment is given in the play, because if you remember, when Laertes hears about Polonius's death, he immediately thinks evil of Claudius and actually starts rebellion and tries to burst into the castle to try to kill Claudius for having supposedly murdered his father. And then Claudius, of course, says, no, 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 it wasn't me. You know, it was, it was Hamlet. We're, we're going to get revenge on Hamlet. It'll be okay. And then woe upon woe, the next thing that happens is that Ophelia, after we've seen her mad scenes, uh, has died. And so Gertrude has to relay this information in a very delicate way so that Laertes will not start a second insurrection. We've just barely pacified him from the first one, the news of his father's death. And so there's been a question of, does she invent these details or how does she describe it? And also notice how she's describing Ophelia's death as accidental because there's the whole question in the graveyard scene of did Ophelia commit suicide or did she drown because of her madness or uh, did she, was it accidental in some way? And of course, um, in the mindset of the time, a suicide would, would lead you to hell. So you would have to have it be accidental. So she cloaks it in this really beautiful poetic imagery. And I've seen productions actually where Gertrude will sort of, you know, envelop Laertes like a sun and almost sing it like a lullaby. So this lament becomes an aspect of soothing, a way of mediating the situation that's in the present by bringing something from the past, but also sort of purging the past in the way it's described in the present. And that in itself can have very classical um, undertones because the fact that a lament is something that can be both public and private. You can, as, as we'll look at with Briseis in just a moment, we'll see how um, something that is of your own grief will also be something that affects communal grief and that everyone will be able to participate in. And here Gertrude is mediating a political difficulty and also soothing uh, Laertes' individual grief as she's relaying a story from the past and potentially altering some details of it to make it more palatable just at that moment to provide a kind of catharsis for Laertes as he goes through. So Laertes has been performed, like I said, this whole scene has been performed almost like a soothing lullaby, portraying grief, but also functioning to mitigate Laertes' fury. And it did have a communal function in that it not only served Gertrude's purpose with Laertes, but like we said, also softened the larger political implications of Laertes' proposed political uprising. A similar function of lament is designated in the Iliad when Briseis mourns Patroclus. Now we're not gonna look at her whole lament here, but you can see that Briseis, the daughter who resembled golden Aphrodite, she sees Patroclus lying there disfigured by the sharp bronze she threw herself on him and let out a shrill lament and then she's tearing her breast and her soft neck and beautiful face with her hands then she a woman like a goddess like the goddesses spoke through tears and then we get her whole lament over patroclus and then it closes with this very beautiful phrase
so she spoke weeping, and the women lamented with her, outwardly for Patroclus, but each for her own sorrows. And this was not just a shift towards individualism, rather this was showing that in community grief, in a community lament, when everyone's gathering together, the individuals merged with the community, and so that the lament will encompass a variety of things and also it will sort of unify the whole group or the whole body that is there everyone can have catharsis for their own grief but also for the whole for the whole group and here's where we hit upon a pivotal point in understanding lament or in hamlet's case melancholy that the lament is not an individual act but a communal one that could unite the immediate individual grief to the larger community grief achilles sings to protoclus and speaks to the embassy but in voicing his own griefs he is also, as his name suggests, voicing the griefs of the people. So this is where we look at, and I get this from um, Gregory Naj, of course, as we'll look at his book in just a minute. But Achilles' name, as you can see here, Achelaos, uh, Naj describes as he who has the achos, which is intense grief of the laos or of the people. So when we see Achilles lamenting, he is standing in as a ritual substitute or as a ritual figure, not just for his own grief, but for the griefs of the whole people. So it's not an individual or an individualistic selfish act as can be uh, viewed in modern scholarship, but rather it's something that was very much part of the community because the uh, those listening to this, this song of the Iliad are not so much thinking about individuals as they are thinking about heroes as stand-ins and as connectors to their own uh, lives as well. And we can see something of that in Hamlet because Hamlet is somebody that we all want to identify with a little bit and yet he's larger than anyone else in the whole play. He's not so much an everyman, but yet every man wants to identify a little bit with him. And so these heroes are both larger than life and they both represent a larger than life grief. So that's why it's important to see that their lament, their melancholy, it might seem excessive to us, but then heroes do have excess and we'll look at that in a little bit. So in the latter half of the Iliad, still talking about Achilles here, he takes on a public role, so public a role, uh, not just sitting aside by himself in the shelter, but mediating peace with Agamemnon, something that will help all of the people, not just himself, fulfilling his role in the battle with divine gusto, uh, judging with greatest finesse the funeral games of Patroclus, which shows he's the ideal leader, and then finally mediating a kind of both public and private priest with Priam, uh, that he can no longer really be called disconnected or a figure apart. And such is the nature of Hamlet's to be or not to be lament as well. And I'm calling it lament because rather than referring to any particular or individual concern, he could have said, my father's dead. This is horrible. My uncle killed my father. This is a terrible thing. I've got to avenge the whole thing. Why did this happen? Ophelia is in with Polonius and they're all spying on me and everything's terrible. He doesn't mention any of his personal griefs. Rather, he makes it very universalized so that he grieves. And as he grieves, each member of the audience can identify with him. And you know, the very nature of the soliloquy is a speech that's spoken by one to himself, but also to the audience. So the audience gets to vicariously participate in the hero's grief and receive in it a kind of catharsis for their own. So in purging Denmark, the audience itself gets to be purged. And then the to be or not to be speech is overheard, not just by the audience, but also by the concealed King Claudius, Polonius, and Ophelia, whose own griefs may be voiced through the same speech. Thus neither hero Achilles nor Hamlet acts purely for himself, but each of their actions is connected both to divine commission and human public good or evil, as the case may be. And each understands the weightiness of their actions, which gives them a little bit of leeway for reflection. And that they do reflect at length is really no crime. However, an excess of length can cause crime to multiply on crime or death to multiply on death, as we'll see in Hamlet, but we'll talk more about excesses later. However, it takes the disconnectedness of the modern individualist to read into either Achilles or Hamlet purely selfish motives. They might think about themselves, but they never fail to also see their connection to a much larger whole. So as we're talking about this, I did want to look at the most famous speech from all of Shakespeare, the to be or not to be speech, to see how it demonstrates what we were just talking about, how every phrase is not something that's just particular to Hamlet, but it's something that everybody in a way can go through. So the fundamental question, should he live, should he not live? What to do, to be or not to be? That is the question. 
whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them so so far it's still very uh, general um, to die to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to tis a consummation devoutly to be wished so he's looking for relief in death and this is actually going to become a theme that we'll see not so much as relief in death as death being the ultimate moment of the hero's literal consummation of everything that he has tried to put together up until that point that will be so with achilles that will be so with hamlet so this phrase a consummation devoutly to be wished we'll just keep that in the back of our minds because it's going to pop up again at a key moment to die to sleep to sleep perchance to dream i there's the rub for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life for who would bear the whips and scorns of time the oppressor's wrong the proud man's contumely the pangs of despised love the law's delay the insolence of office the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin so now we get another catalog and each of these things are again not specific things that have happened to hamlet they're generalized so that everyone who has had something go wrong in their life whether it's been unrequited love whether it has been um uh, being robbed of a position that you're supposed to have, whether it's being uh, false, lied about, whatever it might be, all the types of things that are happening to Hamlet is expressed in the general, not the specific, so that everyone can join in. And he's starting to wonder, what is the purpose of life? Why should I deal with all of this? And of course, he will come to the conclusion that he this is his divinely chosen role and that this will be uh, the medium of his great, to use a Greek term, kleos. Now, then he says, who would fardels bear to grunt under a sweat and un under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose bore no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Now, this phrase, lose the name of action, I've hinted at it before, is something that can really be attributed both to Achilles and to Hamlet. They both, in modern scholarship at least, I don't think the ancients would have had this problem, but in modern scholarship, they lose the name of action. Both are very active. Like we said, swift-footed Achilles, yes, he sits uh, in the shelter for a long period of time, but he's not completely idle. He is, he is actually performing part of his own role in that moment as he's singing the clay on Andron, singing the glories of his fathers of the men, as he's learning about what he's supposed to be doing um, for the next stage in his role. And then when he does finally re-enter the fray at the moment that his nearest and dearest Patroclus has been killed, then he goes in and he is swifter than swift. He is swift-footed Achilles. He's fulfilling his epithet, as it were, when he goes in and actually does do everything, chasing Hector around the walls of Troy. He is very swift and he provides put so much action to the last uh, four books of the Iliad that it's almost more than a lot of the other heroes have done in the larger sections of the Iliad. And the same thing can be said with Hamlet. With Hamlet, we see that, oh, he, you know, he has all these soliloquies, he has all these discussions as he's going through, and yet we sort of wonder, you know, when is he finally going to get to the point where he kills Claudius? And everyone says, oh, well, the problem of delay is simply that, you know, you wouldn't have a play unless you kill the, kill the king at the very last act. But it's much more complicated than that, and we'll actually address that question as we continue on. There are reasons he could not kill Claudius beforehand, both political and divine reasons, and also it will all be fulfilled for both Achilles and Hamlet at the moments of their deaths as they go on. And also just the whole nature of this questioning here. You know, Hamlet is something that is situated in a sort of joint Protestant-Catholic worldview. And it's a point that Hamlet definitely comes to an understanding of the divine purpose of his mission, as he has been commissioned by this otherworldly figure, the ghost, his father, who is coming from the afterlife, and verifies what he has said to be true when he sees what has happened at the murder of Gonzago in the play. But that doesn't stop Hamlet from being able to question. So we just saw this whole meditation on what happens after death, and he never personalizes it so much, but yet he's able to ask questions about it. And this is not 
This is not heresy. This is not doubt in the sense, but rather this is a fundamental right of every human being to question, to be uh, uh, an inquirer. So we think about in the Iliad is also inquiring of the divinities uh, to reveal portions of the past, you know, seeing of this thing, reveal this thing to me that I can't go back and see. And then, of course, it's dealing with questions between the mortals and gods and the meaning of life and what is the point of Achilles uh, life and why does it have to end so soon? And of course, it's tied into a much larger goal of ending the age of heroes and moving into the next season of life. So it does all have to do with um, interrelation of the gods and the mortals, and Achilles is right to be able to inquire into those things. The same with Hamlet. The whole play, actually, you know, different ones of Shakespeare's plays are written in different specific moods. The Hamlet, of course, is written in the interrogative mood. It opens with the question. You see the guards are up there and they're scared that the ghost is going to pop up. It's like, who's there? You know, and Horatio shows up and all these things, you know, stand and unfold thyself. All this stuff happens, but it opens with the question and the entire play is filled with questions. And then the central soliloquy, as we just read, is formulating a series of questions. This or this, this or this, who would do this? Who would stay? Who would live? Who would rather fight? Who would rather die? Who would be afraid of something after death? It's all framed in questions. And in fact, the word question appears 17 times in the play. So this idea of inquiry and looking up and posing questions is fundamental to both the nature of Hamlet and Shakespeare and what we see in the Homeric epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey, that we're meant to be inquiring beings. And in inquiring, Hamlet is being the only one who does so in the play. Other people accept their explanations for people, you know, they come up with their own explanations and sort of stick to them. And if it doesn't quite fit, oh no, uh, Polonius thinks Hamlet, Hamlet must be in love with Ophelia and so much so that this is why he's putting on the, that's, that's why he's gotten to the station of madness. I know it has to be this. And if it isn't so, if I'm right, if I'm wrong about this, feel free to decapitate me. He literally says that, take this from this if it be otherwise. So everyone else has their own set formula of it must be this and this is how I work in life. But Hamlet's one that questions and looks beyond. And he's the only one that really gets to have the information uh, delivered to him from the other world, from his ghostly father, and then comes to a recognition of the divine orchestration of his life by the very end. So this is something that we'll continue to explore throughout the um, lecture. Now, one more thing I want to look at with both the, our, our two bars of Hios and Avon, one more thing I want to look at them as we're talking about, we said the role of the mint can sort of merge past and present and how uh, we saw that with Gertrude and we saw that with Briseis a little bit. So just as the Iliad can allude to or be informed by events of the lost epic cycle, these, these epics and these myths that existed in the past, just as it can be informed by those things and sort of refer to those things, and also can infuse passages with nods to local heroes of hero cults, so Hamlet does a similar thing in blending Nord Nordic saga with Elizabethan present. So of course it's set in Denmark, and we have all these little... <laughs> these little jabs at England, because of course they're sitting in England, everyone's in England, everybody in the room is English, but they're saying things like, oh, we'll send Hamlet to England because, you know, his madness won't be noticed there, ha ha ha, they're all madmen that are there already, and that sort of thing, just joking uh, at the same time in the little banter back and forth about England and Denmark, but also the whole myth that um, Hamlet is created from is from the Norse myth Anleth, and this would have been recorded in the Historic Danica by Saxe Grammaticus. There was also a French version in Istra Tragique. And these versions both sort of blended the idea of a, of a Nordic hero who has to requite a wrong, who has to fix a wrong. And also the idea of putting on madness as a disguise, the antic disposition that Hamlet says, I'm going to put this on. So if you see me acting strangely, notice that I'm going to do this. And this will be my method of testing everybody. Um, by putting on the antic disposition in the original Norse versions, this was a very safe way of preserving your life because you don't want to kill a madman in the in the Danish myth if you killed a madman then whatever spirit was uh, inhabiting him to make him mad could go into you since that person would be dead and you would have killed them so you don't want to take a chance on having that spirit take over your life so it was actually a very uh safe way of being around the court being able to say whatever you want you know you think of the court gesture the fool can say whatever he wants and Hamlet puts on that antic disposition as a way to be able to say what he wants when he wants and to test and watch for everybody's reactions in a kind of Odyssean fashion is very, very fun. So as we've said, 
Homer will blend things from the past, will nod to the epic cycle, will nod to hero cults. Hamlet is blending Danish, English, this mythic character of Amleth, this hero with this very uh, Shakespearean, shall we say modern, or at least contemporary to their age, un understanding of life. And then the past will be brought into present. So as events outside of the stage are recounted or sung by characters within Hamlet, like Gertrude sings of Ophelia's death, we don't see it. Or Hamlet writes to Horatio about the pirate uh, attack at sea, we don't see that, but that is brought into the present through speech, the same thing happens in the Iliad as well. So we'll see that on both sides. Uh, so whether it's Elizabethan present or Nordic saga, saga or madness in England or drinking in Denmark or the religious schism of the Protestant Catholicism or whatever it might be, both the epic and the tragedy are multi-layered and richly embedded narratives and they are cloaked in the greatest verse, I believe, known to either English or Greek, that these two are the greatest things written in their respective tongues. So this next section I'm tattling, entitling of madness and menace, because menace, of course, is the Greek word that refers to Achilles, uh, it's the first word of the Iliad, menin. So the Greek idea of this superhuman fury, the superhuman wrath, it's something that's uh, connected to the gods, and Achilles is being the quasi-mortal channel of it as he is going through his life. And that is something that is he sort of shares with the gods and becomes very godlike in his use of. And of course, the madness for Hamlet is something that he puts on as a disguise. So from the very opening, both the Iliad and Hamlet follow a similar trajectory because in the Iliad, Agamemnon has devoked divine wrath in taking Chryseis and a kind of divine wrath, the menace, in taking Briseis from Achilles. So he's hit it on both sides, angered Apollo, angered Achilles, not very smart uh, in, in a modern sense, but there's it's more complicated than we might like to look at. And then Claudius has done something similar to Agamemnon because he has devoked divine wrath in first murdering his brother, always, always a bad way, and then marrying his former sister-in-law, which by the way, in this time period was considered incest. Uh, Hamlet calls it incestuous sheets. The ghost represents the divine, so he's invoked that kind of divine wrath. The ghost comes and says that it has to be avenged. And then Hamlet represents the Achillean wrath, the menace here. So both heroes, Hamlet and Achilles, suffer for lack of a father's presence, and they also profit from the salvific actions of their mothers. Thetis, as you can see pictured on the right, when she supplicates Zeus and on her uh, son's behalf, she's balancing divine power in her son's favor by supplicating Zeus. And then Gertrude at the end of the play with Hamlet, whether you want to say that it's wittingly or unwittingly that she drinks the poisoned cup that was destined for her son, still it saves him temporarily. So both mothers actually perform an act that really affects their son's uh, outcomes. And then, of course, Hamlet and Achilles are both men that are set apart. Achilles is the best of the Achaeans. Hamlet is clearly the best of the Danes. One is sitting apart by the ships and the other is wandering apart in the halls of Elsinore. And both of them are given a divine destiny. Achilles states in book nine, when he has set aside his lyre temporarily to describe the two paths open to him, as you can see here, he says, my mother, Thetis of the Silver Feet, tells me that there are two specters carrying me towards the end of death. If I remain here and fight around the city of the Trojans, I shall lose my homecoming, but my fame will never die. Well, if I go back home to my dear native land, my noble fame will be lost, but my life will be long, and the end of death will not come quickly upon me. So he has these two, or he says that he has these two ways open to him, and of course he has to make the choice that will result in a short life, but eternal chaos or uh, fame in song. So they both have this sort of divine destiny. And he said, these two specters in front of me, what should I do? Should I return home and have a long life without Kleos or remain and rejoin the battle in which he's fated to die, but have his name eternally sung? Now, Hamlet actually could have sat comfortably on the knowledge of his father's murder and then eventually inherit the throne from Claudius. But instead, he, like Achilles, accepts his divinely ordained role as a scourge. And Hamlet chooses to live for a short time so that he might avenge his father and purge Denmark of murderers, including himself once he has killed Polonius. And then he accepts his role not as a monarch, but as a transitionary figure ushering in a new era of peace. And that's what we see at the very end of the play when Fortinbras comes in and he says, well, he has my dying voice. I prophesy, I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. He will usher in a new era of peace because he has purged everything that was rotten in Denmark. And then Achilles has to live for a short time by returning to the Trojan War to avenge his Philos, his nearest and dearest Patroclus, and in doing so he accepts his role in a divinely orchestrated purgation of the Age of Heroes. Now dying at the zenith of their lives and their achievements, neither hero, Achilles nor Hamlet, gets to live to see the next generation, but each in his own way sets the stage for generations to come, and each of them will be divinely sung. 
Now, interestingly, both participate as singers of and in their own songs. Achilles, as he sings the Clea Andron on his lyre, and Hamlet, as he actually inserts lines into the play, remember when he's creating the mousetrap play, the murder of Gonzaga, where he's going to use to try to trick Claudius into revealing what he has done, since he can't be 100% sure if the ghost is something that is real, or if it might be, you know, a devil that knows how to put on a pleasing shape to trick him. So he has to create this play. And when he does, he says, could you, could you let me insert, you know, like maybe 16 lines or so into this play that I've written? So we learn that Hamlet plays at being a playwright. And then he also tells the actors how to perform their roles and sort of directs the whole thing. So we see him kind of being almost a stand-in for Shakespeare in the way that Achilles can become sort of a stand-in for the bard at certain points here. So both Achilles and, oh, Achilles is singing on his lyre, and then Hamlet inserts lines to play that he's practically directing. So both Achilles and Hamlet then function as stand-ins for their creators. Achilles performing the role of a bard, Hamlet alternately actor, director, playwright. And both of them can be seen as connected to or as incarnations of Apollo. Achilles, this is a point that is brought out very strongly in the book by Gregory Nash, The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours, but Achilles in divine opposition to the one, the god that will be the instigator of his own death, he takes on both the musical and the military aspects of the god, because you know Apollo is the god of the lyre and the bow, and Achilles' uh, lyre that he has in his um, in his tent, or in his shelter rather, he's singing the same type of role that we see Apollo you doing at the end of Iliad book one, and then he also has the military aspect of, of Apollo when he's out in war, so he hinges on both of those types of aspects of Apollo. Uh, but Hamlet, a later incarnation, he reflects the poetic version of Apollo of the ideal Renaissance poet, because you know that Apollo became viewed over a period of time. By the time we get to the Renaissance, we're not thinking about him as this fierce supernatural force anymore, the way we were in the ancient world with the lyre and the bow and with the ability to send plague and that sort of thing. Now we're thinking of him more almost like a kind of muse of poetry. And so Apollo is like, oh, somebody that sort of channels their Apollonic gift is somebody that's just well-versed in poetry. And certainly, uh, Hamlet is well versed in poetry. He speaks the most beautiful poetry written in the English language, but also I think he channels a little bit of that earlier incarnation of Apollo as well, as he will be the one who will be the kind of righteous instigator of the justice at the end, as he will sort of channel the fury and be able to uh, bring about peace to Denmark in his sort of warlike way with the sword. So, in the first meeting with the players who are about to perform the mousetrap play, mouse trap play, or also called the Murder of Gonzago, Hamlet asks to hear a portion of the play describing the events of the fall of Troy. And this is something that's also going to connect Hamlet to Achilles, because the players rehearse a speech that describes Pyrrhus, Neoptolemus, who is the son of Achilles, slaying Priam. So this uh, passage has always been associated with people just thinking about the Aeneid. However, there's a specific role of looking at this character of Pyrrhus, and scholars have noticed that, you know, Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, slaying Priam, uh, how there's a sort of connection to the role that Hamlet is supposed to play as the son of old Hamlet about to kill Claudius, or that's the role that he's supposed to have here. So the connection to Hamlet in between Pyrrhus and him has not gone unnoticed by scholars, as both the son of Achilles and Hamlet are avenging their fathers by slaying their father's enemies. And that Hamlet could be seen in this sense as son of Achilles, both in spirit and in history, is certainly poignant and also has an uh, effect on what we're doing today, seeing Hamlet as a comparative later version of a kind of Achilles. But Hamlet himself seems less taken with this point. He doesn't really care as much about this part where they're talking about the slaughter of Priam. What he wants rather is for them to go on. He says, come on, come on, let's get to the part about Hecuba, come to Hecuba. And so the lament of Hecuba and her mad behavior brings the player, as he's reciting this passage, to tears. And that's a fact that Hamlet rebukes himself with here. He said, look, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function is suited with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? And so he's sort of saying, you know, why can't I... Why can't I enjoy the catharsis of a lament? You know, I'm sort of stuck in this limbo for so long trying to figure out what's the right thing and not trying to find out is the ghost words true is this the next step that i'm supposed to take and so his his focus here is not on the actual act of slaying priam but rather he's concerned with the lament about hecuba he specifically tells the player come to the part on hecuba and then that's the part when he's alone talking to himself is like what's hecuba to him or he to hecuba that he should weep for her so that he's focused on the role of lament is significant for us his concerns not on the act of revenge but on the lament of others his own emotional response their interconnection which 
pushes him to further pushes him further on his quest to verify the veracity of his spectral vision. And the play is the thing, as he says, the play is the thing in which I'll catch the conscience of the king. The play is the thing that will confirm his divine mission. So just seeing him posited in such a way that he's looking at the laments of others makes us question and think about his role to Gertrude, his role to Ophelia, those who will be affected by what he's done and his aspect, his, his, his focus and posture being on the lament and the aftermath more so than the act of what he's going to do. It shows that he's a truly reflective, inquisitive being thinking about the consequences rather than just, I must, I must avenge my father. I need to kill Claudius at the quickest possible opportunity. No, he's thinking about all the implications here. And now we're coming to the point that is really going to, I think, juxtapose Achilles and, and Hamlet in the best possible way and show partly the reasons of their so-called delays. Now, part of what Gregory Nagy talks about in his book, The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours, has to do with the unseasonality, as he calls it, of the hero. And this ties into a phrase that Hamlet uses right after he gets his kind of divine commission from his father. He says, the time is out of joint. And then he curses spite that he was ever uh, born to set it right. So a point of fundamental importance in understanding both Achilles and Hamlet as heroes has to do with this ancient Greek hero concept of heroic timing. And the subject has been dealt with at length in the book that I have up here. Now, Hamlet feels that, like I said, the time is out of joint. In other words, he feels the weight of the labor imposed upon him by his father, the ghost, is about writing time, correcting time. Remember how the ghost was killed or uh, Hamlet's father was killed without having time to shrive or like he was a, he was sent like he said sent to the afterlife with all of his sins on his conscience. He didn't have time for uh, any type of prayer or anything. And so that's why he's living in this purgatory state until all of his sins be purged um, in that concept. So having been killed at the wrong time, he now will have to kill Claudius at precisely the right time in order to right the wrong of things being um, upset here. And then also we see Achilles loses time and that by fulfilling his destiny, his life will be cut short. Like Hamlet, both will be represented as a kind of almost bridegroom, Achilles to Briseis and Hamlet to Ophelia, but never a literal groom. They are each cut off at the cusp, and that Achilles' waits and Hamlet's delays can both be seen within an understanding of heroic unseasonality righted only in the moments of their death. So as Nas describes up here, you see the first quote says, the precise moment when everything comes together for the hero is the moment of death. Before death, and in fact during their whole lifetime, however, heroes are not on time. As we will see, they are unseasonal. And in one of the texts that he was referring to, he said, we have seen Achilles thinking about his future death as glorified by the medium of Kleos. In a sense, we see him scripting his death. And this scripting is all about timing. The timing of heroic death is all important for the hero. And this has to do with our idea, like I said, keeping back in your mind, the death uh, being a consummation devoutly to be wished as we see in to be or not to be, that there's actually an also another concept that he talks about as death being kind of taking the place of marriage, that the two times that a hero can be referred to as being equal to the gods is like an Asapho fragment at the moment of marriage and also in the moment of battle and at the moment of their death. So this idea of being united with the god and all of things coming right at the moment of death is something that we'll see both in Achilles and in uh, Hamlet. And also the fact that they are unseasonal or not on time during their lifetimes, that Achilles spends so much time by the ships and that Hamlet spends so much time uh, doing other things that is actually a quality of the hero, that everything comes together in the last act, in the final moment here. So Hamlet's somewhat of a man for all seasons and also out of season, appearing at first uh, as a university student fresh from Wittenberg. And then later we see him as being a man of about 30 years, according to the grave dig diggers reckoning. And the flux in age is not so much a textual gap, but a kind of transcendence. And the way that, you know, time is not literally counted in the Odyssey, neither is it literally reckoned in Hamlet, but both of them are out of joint. And we'll talk more about the significance of Hamlet's age later. Now, Naja's concept of unseasonality stems from the Greek hero of heroes, Heracles, and this is a hero that both Achilles and Hamlet will compare themselves in terms of. So here he talks about Heracles is more than a model for Achilles. He is a model for all heroes, and I'm taking that to mean Achilles and Hamlet as well. His story brings to life the meaning of the ancient Greek word for hero, heros, and the meaning of the related word for seasonality, hora, and for the goddess of seasonality herself, hera. 
Even the name tells the story. Heracles means he who has the kleos of Hera. And so for those who are familiar with Heracles uh, myth, in Greek myth, Hera stalled Heracles' birth, causing Eurystheus to become king, and that uh, Heracles was forced into an inferior station at Hera's hand, set a chain of events and emotion leading to his labors for which both he and Hera received their kleos. Thus, it is not for being on time that Heracles becomes famous, only his death and Zeus ordained apotheosis of the pyre, does Heracles ever, ever become divinely on time. But it is not for that that we remember him. We remember him for his labors, remember for his not being on time. And then Hamlet's seeming delay, which in reality hinges upon first verifying the fact that the ghost is not an evil spirit, which is confirmed by Claudius's reaction to the mousetrap play. Second, not dispatching Claudius to heaven when he's at prayer, because remember the scene that sometimes gets cut, that uh, Claudius is praying right, this is right after the whole uh, murder of Gonzago play, and he's confirmed that, okay, Claudius has shown guilt on his face, that means that the story the ghost told me is true, so now I'm going to go slay him, and then he hears that he's praying and he thinks, wait a minute, what if you know, my father didn't have time to pray before he died. If I kill him now, maybe maybe he might go to heaven and then that's that's no revenge for my father. So he can't do that. So not dispatching Claudius to heaven when at prayer, which would be an imperfect form of revenge. And then third, mistakenly plummeting Polonius into the afterlife. And from that inadvertently Ophelia into madness, which is the consequence of an or hasty step. All of this can be cataloged under the labors of an unseasonal hero being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And his delay causes tragedy, which he himself will remedy as best he can in his final moments. Now, Achilles' delay for loss of a loved one, Briseis, results in the loss of another dearer loved one, Patroclus, which turns the tide and then causes him to fulfill his divine destiny of re-entering the battle and slaying Hector. And Hamlet's delay over loss of a loved one, his father, results in the loss of other loved ones, Ophelia and eventually Gertrude in the Claudius Laertes plot to murder Hamlet. So both delays are connected to another heroic attribute, the danger of excess. Now, Claudius very wrongly, I would say, because he has no right to do so, accuses Hamlet of excessive grief for his father in the first act. He's like, you know, your father lost a father, the father before him lost a father. You know, this is a natural part of human things. Snap out of it. Don't wear black anymore. Uh, but then Hamlet does have excessive grief at times because, for instance, when Hamlet challenges Laertes to a kind of excessive grief contest over Ophelia, he's just come back from uh, the ship where he was almost killed. He's just come back and had this meditation on death and he's been sort of positioning himself where an acceptance of his divine fate. But then when he sees Ophelia and he sees uh, Laertes jumping in the grave with her and doing these things, he says, ah, oh, you know, I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my son. What wilt thou do for her? The swans, uh, shall, shall me what thou'lt do. Wilt weep, wilt fight, wilt fast, wilt tear thyself, wilt drink up eyes, wilt eat a crocodile. I'll do it. Dost thou come here to whine, to outface me with leaping in her grave? Be buried quick with her and so will I. And if thou prate of mountains, let them throw Throw millions of acres on us till our ground, cinching his pate against the burning zone, make us like a wart. Nay, and thou mouth, I'll rant as well as thou. So, in other words, he's he's having excessive grief here. He's he's flinging himself into a kind of rage and going beyond what would be normal for him to express at this time. And like I said, creating this sort of grief contest with Laertes over Ophelia. But this is sort of in a way, a natural thing for a hero, not that all heroes do things that are irrational, but that they have a tendency to verge towards excess. And that's something that they're constantly warring against. And that's certainly something that this is kind of an isolated instance for Hamlet, because he will come back in just within the same scene or the next scene into an understanding of it's just about timing. It's just about, you know, there's divine providence, the fall of a sparrow. Readiness is all. It's just I have to be at the right place and just go with the divine flow, as it were. So also here, connecting themselves to Heracles and this idea of the hero and the unseasonal hero, Achilles realizes, as we'll see on the left, that not even Heracles could escape the death specter. So not even the mighty Heracles could escape the death specter, he who was loved above all by Lord Zeus, the son of Kronos, but his due destiny and Hera's cruel anger beat him down, and I too, if indeed a destiny like his has been shaped for me, will one day lie in death. This is in book 18, when he's come to the realization of, I'm not going to delay anymore, I am going to accept my due destiny, my fate. And he is positioned positioning himself in terms of Heracles to do this. Now, uh, uh, while at the beginning of the play, before he had been endowed with a divine mission, when he's simply lamenting, Hamlet separated himself as the polar opposite of Heracles. When he's talking about how awful his uncle is in comparison to his father, and how could his mother you know, ever look at his uncle, he says, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. So he's putting himself in opposition, polar opposite to Heracles. 
But then when he meets with the ghost, he says, my fate cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Of course, the sort of strength of Heracles to be able to uh, get the Nemean lion while the others are pulling him back saying, don't follow the ghost, don't follow ghost. He said, no, this is my fate. He has something to say to me. I will. And he even says, I'll make a ghost of him who tries to you know, stop me. I'm going to go. This is my fate. And he becomes hardy, steady as a Nemean lion. So both of the things concerning Hamlet, he's framing himself either in opposition to Heracles, but once he gets his divine mission with the ghost in connection to Heracles. So his mission is associated with that hero of heroes, the same hero Achilles describes himself in terms of the hero who will only be on time at the moment of his death. Now, just as a kind of aside, I wanted to briefly look at the fact that Hamlet also has a, a bit of a connection to Odysseus here, because as we said, he did veer towards or sort of courted excess in, Odyssean, in an Odyssean fashion as well. Remember, he puts on the antic disposition. That's how he describes this famed madness as a disguise both to protect himself and as a method to test others. And he does test everyone, even those he loves most, Ophelia, Gertrude, and the ones that he doesn't care for as much, like Polonius and Claudius and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, whom he discovers are playing him. Uh, he tests everyone except for Horatio, whom he has himself tested already and knows to be true, a fact that he mentions before the play. And then one is reminded of Odysseus's divine disguise as an old man in which he tests not only his enemies, but also his wife and even his father. And when he's testing his father and, and the pain that we see in his father's face, you know, trying to figure out whether Odysseus is dead or whether Odysseus is alive and not knowing what to believe, that latter one sort of borders on excess. So you can see there are excesses, the way he might treat Ophelia in the Get the To a Nunnery scene, the way Odysseus might treat his father in that last scene not always intentional, but that the thing that they have taken on might go a little bit too far and they have to try to pull it back. But also, I think this is fun that Hamlet, you know, he gets portrayed as Pyrrhus in the in the player's speech, the son of Achilles, but then the man who's actually going to slay him will be Laertes, and of course in Hamlet, Ophelia's brother, but that's also the name of Odysseus's father. So we have a few classical elements here that he gets portrayed as the son of Achilles, but killed, gets killed by the father of Odysseus. So it's kind of nice to see Hamlet as sort of posed in between these two um, heroic figures. Now, they do have to have what I call the public theater of revenge. So for Shakespeare's audience, private revenge was unsanctioned. Only public revenge could be sanctioned by the government or providential revenge, which would be ordained by God, were justifiable. How had Hamlet killed Claudius in the prayer scene, he would have done little more than private revenge because nobody would have known or been aware of the king's fault. And in Hamlet's mind, he would have dispatched Claudius to heaven freshly shriven. But in stabbing Claudius before the whole court, on the immediate announcement of Laertes that the treachery of the poisoned cup and the swords was the king's doing, he fulfills both a very public revenge before the court and also his divine spectral commission, as Claudius has blood on his hands at that moment. And Achilles' revenge may also stem from personal motives, the death of Patroclus, but this personal revenge is nested in a much larger communal one. The snatching of Helen, which is the cause of the Greeks sailing to Troy in the first place on the mortal public level, and then Zeus's desire to bring about the end to the age of heroes on the immortal one. Thus Achilles' purposes converge with public and divine. A theater of viewers on the Trojan wall witnesses his pursuit of Hector, and a god places Hector within Achilles' reach. So there's divine aspect there to this public and divine revenge that he gets. And his audience definitely will be experiencing both pity and fear looking down at Hector. And those are Aristotle's ingredients for a perfect tragedy. And they are the very things that are identified in Horatio's speech to the Norwegian audience marching in at the end of Hamlet. He has been given expressly the role of the perpetrator of Cleos. Remember, he says, let me go with you, Hamlet. And Hamlet says, no, stay on and tell the tell. Stay on and tell for anyone that has questions. Let them know what's happened here. And then when uh, Fortune Bross marches in, uh, Horatio says, what is it would you see if all of woe or wonder cease your search? Now, this idea of woe and wonder, there's actually been a whole book written on this, but uh, a scholar by the name of Cunningham, he reads these lines in terms of Aristotle's poetics, and he connects them to the Aristotle's ideas of pity and fear. Woe is pity, wonder, and fear. He says, this is part of the distillation of the tradition, and woe is even a more proper term in English than pity, wonder, than fear. And so he reads this as being kind of a scene in which we see uh, Shakespeare recognizing the divine or rather the Aristotelian ideas of pity and fear. So both Hamlet and Homer provide their respective audiences with all that is necessary for their own catharsis. So just to close, seeing their kind of apotheosis, their final moments, their death scenes. In the Iliad, we of course don't see Achilles' literal death. 
we see his death in substitutes. We see it in Patroclus's death, and we can even see it and kind of mourn for it in Hector's funeral. And the laments which furnish the, furnish the finale of the Iliad function not for the individual only, but for the masses as Trojan women, and in particular one Spartan one, join in the lament. And the burial mound prepared for Hector signals the approach of Achilles' own future death. His death and potential apotheosis are at hand, and cutting him off at his zenith will be the combined force of a man and a god, as Apollo, his counterpart, will furnish the end of the son of a goddess and a man, and effectively the divine purge of the age of quasi-divine heroes. Now, Hamlet, too, like, a, like Achilles, will receive a kind of union with the god in his death, and this is what I mean. First of all, Hamlet gets taken out of the Nordic situation and placed within the Christian tradition that's existing in England at the time. And in that tradition to which Shakespeare's Hamlet is placed, 30 is represented as the age of perfection or fulfillment because it represented thus alternately as the age that Christ began his ministry or at the age which he fulfilled his divine purpose on the cross, depending at which scholar you're looking at. But revealing this age only at the grave scene, remember how we said that he gets shown as a university scholar, but then when he's with the grave digger, they say that he's been around for about 30 years, revealing this at the grave scene in which Hamlet iconically picks up the memento mori of York's skull, this number is being specifically associated with Hamlet's own death and his own spiritual zenith, a death that will have salvific effects because it purges Denmark and in a particularly Christological twist, bequeaths a kingdom, a kingdom of peace to Fortinbras because everything that was evil, everything that was rotten has been purged. And he says, I do prophesy that the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying breath, my dying voice. So the idea of scripting the death and the words that he speaks have to do with what is going to happen to the kingdom after him. So even before he enters his, to follow the typology, Golgotha, Hamlet attests to the divine forces at work in his life. He tells Horatio that there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow, whereas previously he had been charging forth in his own strength and manipulation, resulting in accidental murder and even needing to be reminded of his purpose from his ghostly father. After his salvation at sea, then the return and the journey through the graveyard formed a kind of catalysis and resurrection for him. Hamlet recognizes that, as you can see the quote, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. Now, in the Greek sense, he is finally connected with his daimon. The spiritual and the mortal purposes are aligned for him, and he can fulfill his divine mission. So without this understanding, we're left to judge both Achilles and Hamlet in modern terms of action. They have lost not not but the name, really, for as we've seen, both have been very divinely and at the end of their lives exceptionally active. So our recognition hinges upon a larger view of the world than can be afforded by um, the mere way in which it gets used by scholars. For in reading Homer and Hamlet, we find that there are more things, infinitely more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Um, Irini, I think you're muted. It looks like you're speaking. You're right. <laughs> you're right. I did. I did mute myself politely. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Lauren. I'm going to stop the recording now um, so that we can take some questions.